signal from the noise, and we have a great guest here, Jonathan Elst, co-founder uh, and CTO of Datastax, also heads up the Cassandra uh, project within Apache Foundation. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. I'm joined with Jeff Kelly, our top analyst at Big Data for our wikibon.org, our research team. Uh, Jonathan, so you're up there in the keynote, so welcome to theCUBE, uh, first time on. We get a little technical, uh, we heard. We want to get down in the weeds and talk some tech. Um, for first, before we get into some of the specifics around kind of what's going on in the marketplace and the tech, take us through your keynote this morning. Um, it wasn't live stream, but you guys had a packed house. Uh, Billy was up there doing the kind of welcome, kind of chilling out, had a nice ding on HBase, I, which I have on social cam, we'll play later. But talk about uh, what you talked about in your keynote. What was your key message? Oh, my key message, well, I, I wanted to give people a flavor of what problems people are solving with Cassandra. So I talked about how eBay and Disney and Simple Reach and Source Ninja and Netflix are using Cassandra. Those are all companies that are, I picked those specifically because those are companies giving talks here at the conference about uh, how they're using Cassandra so people can go and get more detail on that. Um, and then I talked about you know, where we're going with Cassandra in terms of what features we're working on and, uh, and when you can expect those. So just kind of a, here's where Cassandra is and uh, where we're going. But what I find really exciting about this market is, and obviously SiliconANGLE, for the folks who don't know, our motto is where computer science meets social science. And, and I'm kind of, I guess I'm in my late 40s, so old school database uh, uh, degree. <laughs> And uh, you know, I've lived the days of the mainframe, and you saw that you know the same kind of movement where you had you know different approaches from relational databases, but things kind of circle back around. So you have a different kind of range of demographics of ages that are in the marketplace that are trying to solve a lot of these big problems around new data and mobile and cloud. So you have kind of old school, you kind of new school. You have open source, scale out, scale up, all this stuff going on. So, so the question I have for you is, what do you see as like the key? Uh, problem being solved right now in the marketplace. Obviously no SQL, it's pretty obvious from the press coverage and a lot of the hype, uh, but from a functional solution, people are adopting no SQL and bringing that into their production environments, yet balancing that with the relational database infrastructure that they have and or will need on top of no SQL. What is the key use cases you see being solved, some problem solved in that area? Um, well, that's a good question, and I think it's worth elaborating a little bit on uh, you know, one of those terms you brought up, the NoSQL you know, movement, if you will. Um, and that's, that's been a, a good and a, a blessing and a curse for us. Um, I was actually at the inaugural NoSQL conference and, uh, that uh, Yuan organized in San Francisco about three years ago, and uh, that, that was where we, it really started taking off. And it's been good because it's really, it really called people's attention to the fact that relational databases uh, you know, are, are a hammer, but not every problem is a nail. Uh, so you know, there, there are other tools that are better at solving specific problems. And, and then the problem with the, with the NoSQL term, of course, is that uh, you know, defining, you know, lumping in everyone that's not a relational database uh, is, is a little bit of a disservice because uh, you know, my, my personal take is there's nothing wrong with SQL as a domain-specific language for accessing data. In fact, it's actually pretty good at that. And so we've been actually taking steps in that direction with Cassandra. We added the Cassandra query language uh, about a year ago. We've been Im improving it steadily since then. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the main uh, thing that we're focused on with Cassandra is saying that you know, we're interested in the scaling part, not, not in the, that language you access it with. We're interested in, in, in scaling applications that are millions of requests per second, that are terabytes of data. You know, this, this is something that the, the engineering trade-offs that Relational Database chose are not a good fit for. And so we've, we've said, you know, you know engineering is trade-offs, right? There's no magic bullet. But we can make choices that are more appropriate for this uh, scaling real-time applications uh, that make Cassandra a better fit than you know, MySQL or like Oracle. On the general purpose versus specialist argument, obviously, you know, we play with Hadoop, we play with HBase, and, and you know, we don't use Cassandra yet in our, because we're a small media group, but, but you know, that's a hard question. Everyone's talking about that, whether it's a data scientist, analyst type, and or a programmer, or developer. You know, specialism is really important in these new emerging areas. The role to general purpose is where the cross and the chasm kind of starts to hit, where you can start attacking those problems. What are you guys seeing with Cassandra as you see more production use cases develop? What are those specific general 
all-purpose problems? Is it scale out, scale up? Is it, what, what, is it online transactional? Is it more writes and less reads? What are you seeing that Cassandra is really hitting the groove on? I mean, I know at Datastacks you guys are doing a lot more to make it more general purpose, but specifically, what beachhead are you navigating off of, and pivoting off of, to solution-wise that you guys are kicking ass in? If I, if I had to pick a single thing that Cassandra does better than anyone else, uh, it's support for multiple data centers. Uh, so we're, we're definitely, we're firmly in the, the scale out camp. Um, we're tackling the, the more you know, OLTP side of things. Um, the problem is that there's, there's not really a great term for what we do because when you say OLTP, people think, well, I have yeah, yeah. begin and commit and, and roll back, right? But if you say, uh, you know, what else can you call it? You, I could say it's short request uh, that you know, we're, we're, we're about answering this you know, small request, millions of times per second. We're not doing joins. We're not doing aggregation. Uh, you know, that, that's, what, that's what we're doing. Um, so I, th I think it's fair to say that a couple years ago, you know, when we first got started, uh, we, we were firmly in kind of like, you know, you use Cassandra for social media. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we've, we've moved beyond that now. You know, I, we, ha we know of uh, literally hundreds of production Cassandra users across all kinds of uh, industries. And uh, yeah, it, it's people it's, are recognizing. It's interesting, man. You brought up multiple data centers. Obviously, we cover the data center like a blanket. Our blog and Wikibon, and you know, we cover converged infrastructure. It's interesting in these new use cases where NoSQL and big data is really relevant. Is these new environments where ingesting a lot of data, uh, it might be write intensive, sometimes more read intensive, so variable. Uh, and it's, those are emerging solutions. But when you talk about data center, one of the things that we've noticed, I want to get your take on this, is that with the with the advancement of solid state. I mean, we've seen a massive shift over the past 18 months from off-premise deployments to maintaining on-premise solutions because with SSDs and solid state, we can actually put in caching layers to either scale up MySQL or other legacy environments. It's changed some of the paradigm of what's going on in the data center. What, what have you seen with Cassandra, if you're playing in the data center, has that made an impact to you? Because obviously, SSDs impact the spinning disk market, which is, right. which is critical when you talk about read writes. So talk about how that has impacted this over the past year or two. Uh, so, so SSDs have been uh, a revolution, a slow revolution, uh, because you, you know, we've had early adopters uh, starting to use that, but it's, it's finally starting to go mainstream. And, uh, and you can see that because you know, Amazon announced that they're doing uh, cloud instances based on SSDs. And uh, there's a rumor that the next version of Microsoft Azure will be entirely SSD based as well. So uh, you know, this is something that we've known was coming. And, uh, yeah, you don't got to be a rocket science to figure out that they got to move off the spinning disk at yeah, some level. Yeah, and you know, uh, uh, two years ago at a, a Python conference, I gave a talk on database scalability, and one of the things I said was that you know, SSDs are as close as a silver bullet as you're going to get, yeah. because you, you, just, you just get that random I.O. performance that just, you, know, you can serve a much larger uh, hot data set than you could on spinning disks and a RAM well, we've cache. We, well, we've seen SSD from not just the database aspect of it, just from a complete re-architecture of uh, data center topologies, where clients and large enterprises were looking at off-premise solutions in cloud and completely throwing those away by staying on-premise because they get the economics and the performance with SSD in the store where storage was critical. And yeah, that's the so, database. So the, the advantage I see to cloud is uh, you know, that, that you can say, I'm not going to focus on you know, hiring ops teams and training them. I'm going to focus on my core business and what I'm good at and out, kind of outsource that infrastructure. You do pay a price premium for that. So I don't, I don't think that there's one right answer for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a hybrid. I mean, right now we see hybrid really dominating where it's a combination of on-prem, off-prem, but it's the whole, everything's going to the cloud, it's just not happening in droves. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing that pretty clearly. Um, but it's not, it's not to say that cloud is not going to die. I mean, cloud will be around. I just don't think cloud is, is as revolutionary as big data is, in the sense of big data being, using data to redevelop applications and whatnot. So, so we're watching that, and, and what I'm curious is, is that, uh, well, I'll let Jeff ask a question. I know he's been, he's been waiting to chime in. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Joe. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can monopolize the whole conversation. No, no, no problem. So, uh, I, I would love to get your take uh, Help help our audience put Cassandra in context of the NoSQL movement in the sense that, you know, are all these new NoSQL databases moving towards the same goal? Or you mentioned the right tool for the right job. Help help our audience understand, you know, okay, they they they, they understand on a conceptual level what Cassandra does, what Mongo might do, what HBase does, but 
really, what's the, are each going for a different use case ultimately, or are they all trying, gonna eventually converge, and the winner will be based on whoever can provide the best support, the best uh, use cases, et cetera? Uh, there, the sum of both, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's definitely things that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Voldemort, another uh, another project, you know, kind of the same general area as Cassandra, uh, dealing with you know uh, large large clusters, um, many many uh, requests per second. Um, so and and we're seeing that there's some consolidation there. That um, you know not not to pick on them, but you know there there aren't a whole there isn't a whole lot of community uh, mm -hmm. around Voldemort. Uh, and so, so there's some consolidation in that respect. Now, especially you know, when you're using an open source project, you know, it's like, you know, does an old soldier ever die, right? <laughs> you know, it can, it can live on as long as someone's interested in, in maintaining mm -hmm. that. But, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a few leaders that are going to accrue uh, more momentum around them. Um, so, but, but then there is room for, I think, uh, you know, diversification in that, you know, MongoDB, for instance, is tackling something different. You know, mm -hmm. they're looking at being uh, a very easy to get into, very developer-friendly thing for hobbyists and small companies. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, MongoDB isn't really tackling the, I want to scale to dozens right. and hundreds of machines. Uh, so we don't really see them as, as competitors in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the community, and I think that's going to play a really important role in terms of which of these uh, which of the databases kind of comes to the fore over the next couple of years? Because really, as you move into the enterprise, the more traditional, maybe risk-averse IT departments, really what they're looking for is the community, the support, uh, regular upgrade cycles, uh, company like Datastax providing security and, and management capabilities, et cetera. Um, so uh, John asked a little bit about this before, but can you elaborate a little more on the, the you know, what's the community like? What's the, what's the vibe uh, in the Cassandra community? Um, maybe compare it to what we're seeing in the HBase community? You know, is it? Um, what's the personality? Yeah, and are you confident that it's, it's, it's the right community to, to kind of move this into an enterprise, uh, to the enterprise level? Uh, well, we, we are seeing a, a little bit of a shift in the community as we've gone, we've, we've started to move beyond like the really early adopters. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, two years ago we had the first Cassandra Summit, we had, you know, less than 200 people there, right? Uh, so now we have over 800. And so the audience has, has changed a little bit mm -hmm. as, that, as that's happened. Uh, but if, if I were to, to pick one adjective for Cassandra users, I would say it would be problem solvers. That, uh, you know, we're, we're practical, and you know, there, there's some there's some communities that I would say uh, might be characterized as being elitists. So we're we're concerned about having the best technology, and we really want to push the technology forward. But we we don't want to. We, we want to make it accessible mm -hmm. at the same time, if that makes sense. Rather than kind of on a theoretical level, we have this great technology, but practically, what can you do with it? Versus what you guys, what you're saying, I think, is that you know we're really focused on practically getting down to use cases and solving real problems for the business. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a conversation with uh, a, a, a guy in academia uh, where he's saying, you know, pro this product is, is um, you know, way better from these theoretical uh, standpoints, uh, but oh, by the way, it crashes and loses data, right? <laughs> uh, so, right. so that's the kind of thing that, you know, in the real world, that, that really matters. Yeah. So let's talk about developers. Obviously, this is um, the wheelhouse for developers. O open source is fantastic. We're like, what, on our I think third generation of open source. We see in it, open source is no longer the other approach. It's, it's the approach. Everyone's using open source from startups to big companies. Um, developers, programming languages and frameworks has been all the rage. You know, Spring was bought by VMware. You got Rails, you got Python, all these different languages and frameworks. Um, Hadoop versus Java versus C. Is there a difference? I mean, obviously, one's has different type of attracts different kind of programmers. Um, C is more kind of hardcore. I would call hardcore coders. Um, I think that's what you're saying. Kind of problem solvers. Maybe that might be more more of a, a description. Are you guys more hardcore coders than say? I don't want to say Java is not hardcore coders, but like you know, Java is easier. But which one lends itself better, or is there a tool? Is there a hammer versus a chainsaw? Or, you know, what's the, take, break that down, Java versus C and C++. You know. um, so I guess I can, I guess I can take and make an analogy there to the, the NoSQL space. Um, so the Java was designed as kind of a response to C++ and saying that you know, the people who designed Java were all C++ users and they're saying, these are the problems we have with C++ on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the big one of those was uh, memory management. 
and saying, you know, I have to malloc and free, I have to new and delete, and I have to take care of that. You know, and tracking down memory leaks is a big uh, part of my time that, that the language or the environment should be taken care of for me. So that, you know, that, so Java is easier because you have that memory management built in, but that's sol it's not like it's easy because I'm giving up power, it's easy because I'm solving a real problem. Um, so Cassandra is kind of a, a second generation uh, NoSQL system in the sense that um, HBase, uh, as you know, is uh, inspired directly by Google's Bigtable. Uh, and Cassandra came out. But of, Bigtable, I believe, wasn't Java based. That was C++. Uh, wasn't it? Yes, it was based. In, it was built on C++. Uh, yes, uh, but the the analogy I want to go with is that you know, the people behind Cassandra were able to look at uh, the Bigtable design and say, well, you know, these are the the sharp edges there. You know, it has these single points of failure. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to architect Cassandra around a fully distributed system. We're going to give you a similar data model where you have rows and columns, unlike some other first generation uh, NoSQL products that were strictly key value, right? So Cassandra is going to give you the both, best of both worlds, a fully distributed system with a powerful data model. Awesome, well that, that brings up a lot of different arguments, but again, back to the point of explain to the developers your philosophy from your personal perspective around this no one size fits all, no one tool for the job. And you know, there's a quote on, on Quora I tweeted earlier, or last night, is that any developer worth their salt is not going to be hung up on one stack. Um, explain your philosophy on this. Do you believe in that? Um, or should it be like, oh, I like American League Baseball versus National League Baseball? I mean, or, yeah. or you know, I mean, in, in a way, isn't that what we're talking about here? It's like, what your, what's your flavor? Yeah, I mean, I, I can uh, relate that to my own uh, uh, career in a couple ways. You know, I've, I'm a, a big fan of the Python language. Um, I've, I've spoken at PyCon uh, you know, for you know, five, probably five times, uh, and really big fan of that. Really like yeah. the elegance there. Uh, but you know, when I when it came when I started investigating uh, scalable databases for Rackspace back in the day, uh, you know, I, building a database in Python just you know it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it's it's. Uh, you know, you've got you've got some problems around concern, concurrency with the global interpreter lock, uh, and more fundamentally, you know, Java is five to ten times faster, uh, and so that's that's a, a something that I'm willing to give up some of the expressivity in Python to get that performance. And so, you know, I, I make no apologies about uh, you know being a Python guy at heart, you know, writing Java code all day. Yeah, it's kind of like you know. What kind of artist are you? you? Want to do a quick hack and then find a solution and then kind of really build it out. Which brings up my next question: Is that being kind of a student of entrepreneurship and tech over the past you know 30 years, um, we've had an interesting past decade. You know, we moved from you know Web 1.0 to seeing things like iTunes, YouTube, stuff we weren't around a decade ago. Um, but from an entrepreneurial perspective with open source, you can start a company up and pop some MySQL. Amazon's been an amazing resource of getting started. Look at Twitter, look at Zynga. These are great examples of companies and Facebook just explode on the scene and developing really fast. Um, but then they realize, damn, we have to really read architects. So, you know, it's well documented on Quora. You go anywhere, it's all well documented. It's like, you got the problem of, we got critical mass, and we got, got our funding, debt. and we got technical problems, which is shit. We got to change the airplane engine out at 30,000 feet. Um, you know, Zynga went through it, Twitter tried to do it. I know Cassandra's been, been talked about as plugging in, plugging out. Um, talk about that dynamic from a quote, historical perspective, because it's a great thing. Build a company, get it funded, prove the model, everyone's happy, but then you know, you're at a critical juncture of, I got to really rebuild to scale. Yeah. And th there's some serious you know, computer science involved, really serious tech. What is that? Where is that line? What is that benchmark? And, and what do developers do today to avoid that? Uh, knowing what we've learned through. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure avoiding it is even necessarily the right thing to do. You know, even if I had a crystal ball that says, I'm going to be at 100 million users in five years, uh, you know, maybe I still start off with building it on, on PostgreSQL because, you know, if, I'm more, if my team's more familiar with that, you know, it's, it's okay sometimes to accrue technical debt as long as you know what you're getting into and you're making that uh, decision deliberately. So, uh, you know, an example I, I gave in my keynote this morning was uh, Source Ninja uh, is using Cassandra, but that's not the system they started with. You know, they, they uh, started off with something they were more familiar with, uh, ran into the, the limitations of that, and then they said, okay, well now we have 
Um, you know, we have the revenue, we have the users, uh, and it's time to, to start paying down some of that technical debt. I mm -hmm. think that's a totally reasonable thing take to us, do. Take us through your advice if you were brought in as a consultant, knowing what you know now and looking forward. And you know, obviously, you know, Quora's littered with, you know, I tried Cassandra, it was too hard, the UI tools aren't there, they need more tooling. Obviously, Datastax is doing some things there, but take us through uh, what Cassandra can do for that startup, that company that says, hey, you know what, We've, we were doing some black shoals out in, the, out in the cloud, we started tweaking around, we built an app around it, we've done this app, I mean, this is a random example, and then now, shit, we got to scale this. Or what, where would Cassandra fit, and how would that, how does someone get from, hey, we have, our, we have technical chops, but we have some technical debt to get out of. Right. Where does Cassandra fit? Can you just take us through a quick, quick example of where that would be great? Uh, so, what, what people typically do is they start by saying, you know, I have, you know, these five tables are 80% of my reads and writes. So those are the logical candidates to, I'll start by moving those to Cassandra. And then, you, then when, when, you're, when you're using Cassandra, uh, Cassandra forces you to think efficiently. Uh, and it, it makes you discard some kind of bad habits. Uh, I've heard a rumor that you know, the, the first thing that uh, eBay does when they bring a new hire onto their core team, you know, they're, they're built on Oracle, uh, well, except where they're using Cassandra now, but, you know, <laughs> but <they're laughs> How to quickly get the guy to quit, work on the Oracle system. <laughs> but but uh, you know, they, <laughs> they train people on Oracle, at least this is what I've heard, to, to not do joins. You know, we we yeah. use Oracle, but we don't do joins because that, that yeah. just doesn't scale. Uh, so Cassandra says, you know, we're not going to give you that security blanket. You, we don't support It's kind of like the real estate. They show you the crappy houses first and then show you, I want that house. <laughs> um, you play with Oracle and then move to Cassandra. It's, it's a dream. Okay, that's cool. Um, Jeff, anything else? Well, I know, you know, uh, your talk today was all about the future. So I just wanted to get your take on, you know, where are we going if we're, in this, if we're at this table in a year from now? What are some of the key, uh, either key limitations or the key uh, projects you're working on uh, that we're going to see addressed over the next year, uh, both uh, among the community specifically and, and to, to some degree data stacks uh, specifically, what they're working on as well? I, I guess if I had to pick kind of a theme for, for what we're doing, uh, it would probably be um, so better support for uh, large uh, cluster members. So, mm -hmm. so right now the, the sweet spot for a Cassandra cluster is lots of uh, fairly small machines. So mm -hmm. you know, maybe okay. eight cores and uh, you know, a terabyte of disk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so relatively you know, thinner machines. And you know, for, for a bunch of reasons, uh, you know, there's demand for supporting you know, 32 cores, uh, you know, eight terabytes, and, and, and being able to you know, scale up better as well as scaling huh. out. Where's that, where's uh, that coming from? That, that, that uh, so, well, I, I don't know if I, if I can name names, but for <laughs> instance, uh, one Cassandra user uh, is using Cassandra as kind of part of an appliance. Okay. And so they, they want to uh, ship this, this messaging platform that they have on a uh, relatively uh, small number of machines. And so th they'll make those beefier. They mm -hmm. would rather make them beefier than uh, you know, add more machines, machine, yeah. within reason, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, past a certain point, it becomes not cost effective. Right. Uh, but uh, up to that point, they would rather have uh, you know, fewer, beefier machines. So, you know, this is something that, we, that we're working on, is, mm -hmm. is supporting those better. So I mentioned in the keynote, uh, support for, you know, letting Cassandra uh, manage the disks in a JBOD configuration so it can get the maximum uh, use out of those. Uh, the virtual nodes that I mentioned, uh, so that you can parallelize rebuilds. If you lose a machine, I want to be able to parallelize that rebuild across my entire cluster mm -hmm. uh, because if I'm, if I'm streaming eight terabytes from just a single source, you know, that's going to take me a while. But if I can stream it in from a dozen sources, you know, I cut that by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, that, that's kind of one theme, I think, uh, of the improvements we're making. Quick breakdown for, as we kind of wind up the segment um, for our final questions. Just Break down the horses on the track for us. Cassandra, HBase, Mongo, Couch. Okay. Okay, you know, Jeff's favorite line, or Dave Vellante, my co-host, says horses for courses. You know, some run better in the mud, some run better on a dry track, grass, uh, whatever. I mean, break those down, because that's really on the table, those guys. Yeah. Um, um, so, so I mean, people, it, people are talking about it. They just want to know. Just give us your quick personal take on that. Yeah. So I would say that uh, Couch and Mongo are kind of going after the same market, and then Cassandra and HBase are going after the same market. Uh, Couch and MongoDB, you know, both 
talking about let's make things easier for developers. Uh, Couch especially talking about being able to you know, take data offline and, and uh, resynchronize later on. Uh, but they're both focused on you know, relatively small data sets. Uh, you know, MongoDB has this uh, uh, global write lock and that, that is problematic as you try to scale uh, up. Um, and so, you know, kind of, kind of a different market than uh, what HBase and Cassandra are going after. Uh, HBase is one of the, the systems that I looked at when I was at Rackspace. So I wasn't one of the founders of Cassandra, right? Uh, so I came onto it after it was uh, moved into the Apache project. Uh, so I was looking at these, these different systems because Rackspace knew that they needed scalable infrastructure. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're playing with Amazon and Google. They know that if they're playing with the big boys, they need you know, big boy toys. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, and I've had many conversations with Lou Mormon over there about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I, I looked. It at, took a few tries. HBase was one of the systems that I looked at, and uh, it was more mature than Cassandra in a lot of ways back then. Uh, but you know, the uh, architecturally, you know, it's built around you know the HDFS name node is a single point of failure. Then you have the H master and the the the, the region servers, and uh, it, it's it's. It's not a system that can, can run continu continuously when you have machines failing. And, uh, and there's a lot of complexity involved there too. You have you know, those, those three uh, services that I mentioned, you also have Zookeeper thrown into the mix, you have HDFS data nodes. So there, there's a lot of complexity around that. And so that's why I think you tend to see uh, HBase deployed into shops that have heavily bought into HDFS already and have a team of uh, you know, deep experts that can dig into that. Uh, we have a. a we, we we were at the HBase conference uh, in San Francisco, the first one, and we called HBase the the tailored suit. Once you have <laughs> it tailored, it's rocking and rolling. But don't try to <laughs> give that to somebody else. Yeah, I think. Yeah, so use case wise, really talking about if you if you have the team in place, you have the expertise and the use case, HBase could be great. Yeah. So I think Cassandra improves on that. Both Do you agree in, with that? Uh, Somewhat? Yeah, I guess I'd, I would agree with that. I mean, it, you you can make it work if you have the expertise, yeah. uh, but it, it's still you know even if you have the expertise, that's not going to make uh, some fundamental limitations go away. Uh, for instance, you know, Facebook has one of the the deepest uh, Hadoop and HBase teams around, but their HBase cluster they've actually sharded that into multiple uh, HBase shards because of that uh, name node single point of failure that they have. Yeah. Uh, and so, and they've also limited to only a specific aspect of the platform. Uh, the, yeah, the I mean, there, there's some politics there. Yeah. I mean, their their MySQL team thinks that you know MySQL is the way to go, and so yeah. forth, right? So it's not entirely a technical decision, but. Um, uh, I mean, what's the point of using a distributed database if you have to go ahead yeah, and shard it again yeah. afterwards? So, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I th these are some of the things I was evaluating when I was looking at these things. So um, I do think that Cassandra has the edge uh, architecturally. So I, I said earlier, you know, we're, we're not trying to be elitist about it, but mm -hmm. we do want to be aware of uh, you know, that this kind of architecture difference does matter uh, and, that, and that will affect your, your site uh, uptime. Uh, so yeah, I love yeah. talking to uh, you know, computer science dudes coming right out of college to see what kind of they think and to kind of the more senior guys who've been on the block with you know, distributed computing and systems, you kind of have a different kind of blend. The old school systems guys see certain things a certain way and the new school guys see things other ways. Uh, but that being said, um, really I look at it down in terms of applications, mobile, Geo for example. I mean Mongo has been credited. I think uh, Foursquare uses Mongo uh, for some of their Geo work. Is there an, um, a generalization you could say, this is better for that, you mentioned da multiple data centers for Cassandra. Would you say that mobile type developers would be better for Mongo or is there a different, is there, uh, is there a uh, general use case? <laughs> I don't want to be specific. Um, so, I mean, really, MongoDB uh, stops being appropriate once you hit data sets that don't fit in memory. Uh, just because of the way their storage engine works. The, the performance really falls off a cliff. Uh, so uh, mobile uh, uh, focused developers, you know, Urban Airship, for instance, do a lot in the mobile space, uh, but uh, you know, they, they tried out Mongo and then, then uh, ran away from it and be because of you know, these limitations. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if, if I'd, uh, I'd, I'd have a hard time breaking it down into uh, uh, d domains or application domains. I think it's, it's more. It's not that mature yet, either it, way. It, it's more about the scale of the problem. That uh, if you have a Cassandra sized problem, then MongoDB isn't really an option. 
Got it, cool. Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of politics. I mean, you mentioned Facebook. I was, you know, I read a comment from Adam D'Angelo Quora saying, oh yeah, yeah, we're just going to use MySQL and we'll throw more caching layers on top. So their answer is just, you know, throw more, scale up and throw more cash at it. Yeah, so Adam said that in uh, 2010. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, at the time, you know, obviously Cassandra was a lot less mature. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to try to convince anyone who's not comfortable with Cassandra to say that you, know, you absolutely should use this. If, you know, if you're more comfortable sharding MySQL, you know, go for it. But I think There's trade-offs either way. Right? There, there is trade-offs, and uh, I think you can make an excellent case. Uh, if I talked to Adam today, I would definitely make a good case that in 2012, uh, you, should, you should be going with Cassandra instead. All right, final question for me, and Jeff will give you a final question. Um, looking out over the next year for Cassandra Summit 13, just in your mind's eye, shoot the, shoot the arrow forward. What do you think is going to happen? What do you, how do you think the, the, the market will evolve? How do you think the community will evolve? And potentially, what will your slides look like next year? I'm not asking you to tell you what slides are, but just conceptually, where do you hope to be, um, given kind of the macro tech environment and just some of the, the conditions of the market? Well, I, I want to see us continue uh, broadening uh, the, uh, the scope of the developer that we can appeal to and, and make it so you don't have to be quite so hardcore uh, to use Cassandra. We have a screencast up, uh, I think it's called Cassandra in Two Minutes, where uh, one, of, one of our engineers named Jake Luciani uh, walks you through standing up a four-node Cass Cassandra cluster literally in two minutes. And, uh, and you know, so from the operational standpoint, uh, we have a really good story about, you know, our, by having a fully distributed cluster where every node is the same, you don't have to special case these things or build them on special hardware. You know, it really, it really has a good story there. We want to continue improving our developer story uh, to match the ease of use of operations. So I talked about some of the things we're doing in CQL uh, for 1.2, and we're, we're going to continue to uh, move that ball forwards and uh, continue to make lives easier when people build applications on Cassandra. Okay, all right, uh, Jonathan Ellis is co-founder of uh, Datastack, CTO of Datastack, also running the Apache project uh, over at the Cassandra project over at Apache. Thank you for coming on theCUBE, great conversation. We'll be right back with our next guest after this break. Thanks for having me. Okay. Nice, good job. <laughs>